finish up on getting some comments from the administration on other sections of the bill. Uh, so we could do that hopefully in five or ten minutes, and we'll go through and we'll walk through the bill itself. I can do it really quick. Yeah. Okay. So looking through your bill quickly, um, um, the first section um, contains the chapter 117, the, the stick provisions um, to um, make local bylaws updated to you know, enable the smaller lots to um, increase flexibility around accessory dwelling units to enable duplexes. Um, that's the big, a big chunk of your provision. It also includes the Act 250 changes um, to exempt downtowns and neighborhood development areas from Act 250. So those, those, that section covers uh, the stuff that you had in Europe right. as well. Okay. Right. But um, right now, just to be clear, the administration has pulled back from the 117 changes, right. Right. and we are recommending a, an well, incentive-based voluntary right. approach. Um, so there's a difference there. What it doesn't include um, um, are the, the tax credits, the proposed tax credits within the neighborhood development areas and the expansion of the downtown and village center tax credits. Um, it doesn't include, and it may not need to, but the VHIP program. Um, the VHIP program? Yeah. That's yeah. another bill. Yeah, okay, so it maybe doesn't need to put, probably an appropriation for it needs to be traced to somewhere. <coughs> um, as you noted, money is what makes things happen. It doesn't include the language um, um, for water and wastewater connections for um, delegating that to munici uh, municipalities. The, the money? No, well, we talked about the double permitting. Right. Um, there's language um, that <coughs> requires the secretary to, to, when municipalities request um, to take ownership of the connection process. Um, that's not in this bill. Um, it was detailed in our package, but it was not in your bill. Um, the Opportunity Zone incentive that we talked about. Uh, I'm curious as to why that didn't make it in. The Opportunity Zone credit that we talked about at the very end is not in there. And then the Better Places proposal for the crowd granting is right. not in there. Right. The language for all that is ready to right. go. It's in Representative Marcotte's bill with the exception of Chapter 117 stuff. Ellen's worked on all that and should be able to, you know, if the committee wants to add all that back in, it should be fairly easy, I hope. To pull it back in. So you said the crowd sourcing, the opportunity zones, the well, Wait. all the money, none of the money stuff no. is in here. Right. I think even in the version that you were working on mm -hmm. initially, you said it's a TBD determined. Yeah. Right. And it's you know your discretion how you want to handle that. Um, we presume the governor's you know going to plug budget money into the budget bill. Um, and I don't know what the process is. Do you also include that in your bill? I, that's for somebody else. And then the wastewater uh, duplication fix. The ANR permitting. <clears throat> and Alan, did I miss anything? You're... Okay, so what, what I'd like you to do <laughs> at this point is work with, uh, I think, I mean, there's several attorneys working mm -hmm. on this bill, but I, David Hall was the lead person. Mm -hmm. So why don't you work with David, who will work with Ellen and uh, others, to just uh, do an annotated an annotation alongside mm -hmm. 237 of what's missing, where you have what you, if you have any opinion on any sections of here mm -hmm. that were. Uh, added on. Uh, and then to the back of your bill, is, this looks like placeholder language for the bond. Um, and right. that's, that encompasses your entire bill. Right. <clears throat> OK. So things like the inclusionary zoning thing, that mm -hmm. was in your draft. That's language mm -hmm. from your draft. OK. okay. Uh, I would like to. things that's in, you didn't mention anything about uh, short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to say on that at this point? It basically gives you authority to, to, to collect information and adopt rules right. based upon. The, the 117 language basically, municipalities can already regulate short-term rentals right now. Um, what that, there's a line in your bill that we include, that we recommend it. Just, it, 
put a spotlight on municipalities can do this and just pointed out their ability to do it. Um, you don't need to specifically enable it, but we thought it'd be helpful since it is a concern um, just to spotlight it. Doesn't John Representative Harris have a bill? I think I saw something, that. yeah. Um, but I, so I have My understanding is that's not the case, is that, um, that you, uh, the municipalities without charters need to have specific uh, ability to create ordinances about this. That doesn't make any sense to me, but we have I smart know, lawyers. We have different uh, opinions <laughs> on that, I uh, believe. So I think we also have language. Uh, I mean, we, we also are getting our first data on short-term rentals, um, our five-year housing needs assessment um, that we're contracting with, um, with the HFA. We put a provision to track short-term rentals, and we have uh, the first reporting of that. Um, you know, we know the top 10 towns, they're all next to ski areas. You know, that, that's where the top 10 um, short-term rental market is. Um, Killington, you know, not Woodstock, Warren. You know, it, it's right at the ski areas. Um, we also know which counties have the highest percent and the lowest percent, um, the average per night stay. Um, we have a, 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 some info that we're starting to analyze here. But we don't have any info on, in that probably on how many houses that otherwise could be full-time homeowners are now being used as short-term rent. No. You don't have the affordable well, houses that have been taken offline. But we have, as a result of short -term right? Rates. But we have um, data for several years about you know which um, owner-occupied homes, rental homes, and then seasonal recreation or occasional use. And we have um, you know charts that show communities that have high levels of seasonal homes and their short-term rental uh, percentage, and those that have low and. Um, and also the tourism department is also conducting a short-term rental study right now. So we're just getting the first data. And you know what's interesting is there really was a spike for whatever reason in the summer of 2017. Um, and then since then, it's been you know fairly flat. It hasn't been rising um, much since then. But for whatever reason, in the summer of 2017, maybe a new marketplace came online or, or something. Um, and so we're, we're finally collecting some interesting data. You know, Lamoille County is the highest percentage um, of short-term rentals in the state. Um, Chittenden is the lowest. So I, I don't, we don't have a proposal of how to, to regulate this, but um, we're evaluating the data right now. Um, Do we have a copy of that? Yeah. It, this is draft. It's just draft. It's okay, just draft. Um, right. one, this will be a, a statewide five-year housing needs assessment that people rely on. It's got a huge housing stock, yep. which has some okay. interesting that um, that we've actually been growing rental properties in the state faster than homeowner um, ho homeowner units in the state for the last several years. It's the first time that's happened in Vermont um, ever. So there's some interesting data in here that I'd be happy to come back and give highlights or whatever you guys want. Is that report almost finished? Um, I, another month. Okay, and where is all this data coming from? Um, census numbers all over the place. I'm looking at Sean back there. Um, uh, yeah, a lot Can of it's the phone? Census Bureau. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, do you know all those sources, Sean? Uh, Sean Gilpin, um, Housing Policy Specialist with the Department. Um, we're working with, with the HFA. Much of it is census-based. Some of it is um, the short-term rental is coming from uh, Air uh, DNA. known as AirDNA. Um, there are a number of different sources on the page compiled. It's, uh, I just got another 160 pages of work this morning. So we're working on this is, this is um, required every five years for all of our HUD funding, Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, for CDBG, the Home Funds, the National Housing Trust Fund. Um, the last one everyone referred to is the Bowen Report, where we found that gap really was the 80 to 120 that we weren't producing units for. And so this will be you know, a, a, a document, a, a study that's referred to for next several years to, to address housing needs. So it's, it's not something we want to rush out drafts of information on until it's been vetted um, and you know we're certain that everything is is, is um, so when are we quality it should be a month. Um, a, a month but we have to submit it to HUD in May 
but we will have it this winter. I promise. So we need it <coughs> as a tool for our group. But, you know. Let's say sure. early February it might be something we can start sharing. I mean, short-term rental is a complicated issue because um, a lot of people use the income to stay in their house. A lot of seniors use it to, you know, be able to pay their taxes and take a care of things. A lot of people use it for investment properties. Absolutely, in and and I think it uh, because it is complicated and because um, we are a tourist state and and we, um, it gets more complicated. And I think what's really needed is better guidance for any municipalities about the tools and options they can use to, to, to regulate this on a community by community basis. Um, and, and, you know, and, and this is just my quick assumption from that data point that the 10 communities are all ski area towns. You know, that I don't know that it's automatically you could assume that those houses would have been available as affordable housing. It's someone that's, that those homes are vacation homes family rental they're they're not openly on the available on the market as affordable housing year-round um, from from what I know from the data a lot of the accessory dwelling units however have been being rented to staff who work on those mountains who can no longer afford to live in those communities because those accessible I mean affordable I mean accessory dwelling units are being now used as uh, Airbnb. So actually, there is impact anecdotally from all of us about uh, what is being taken <clears throat> offline. So I think we need to put some science behind what's being taken offline uh, that have been have been embedded and have been part of how we house our seasonal staff, particularly in ski areas, actually. And um, anyway, it's 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 a big conversation, and um, I think giving municipalities tools to thoughtfully address it is, is terrific. And some data to inform the conversation. And I have a community that's done that. Um, but I would uh, also say we have to have some statewide expectation and value address to this. And I would argue that yes, we're a tourist state, but we have plenty of, you know, that it also pits B&Bs and inns and motels and hotels against, you know, so it's, we already have an industry that we also want to support. So. It, it's complicated. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> it's the gig economy. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it's evolving very fast, uh -huh. and there are different approaches being taken in many municipalities, other states. No. I, I, I don't know. Someone told me that New York has, New York City has banned them. Yeah. No. You know, there's a great article in the Times where you know, yeah, they just and enforced, you know. Well, and many, as we know, many co-op building, I mean, many buildings in New York already have so many strict regulations about who they're able to, who owners are able to <coughs> Okay, well, thank yep. you. All right, so we'll follow up with Ledge Council and work yeah. to put those pieces together. We'll have you back next week. Sure. I hope you'll be around as a resource as we keep adding, deleting, <laughs> modifying. You. You, we plan on spending a lot of time yep. with you. <laughs> <laughs> like it or not. There's always pastries and birthday parties. <laughs> Thank you. We're a celebratory event. Should I give David all the heads up? How are you? He's on next. I think Ellen Lee. So I'm a mover. That is great. And then Becky. And then David is projected. Thank you. I don't know if you're around. I don't know if you're around. Thank you. So well, please introduce yourself. Oh, can I have my bill back? Oh, you gave it to. I, I lent it. it. I have it. It was a loan, not a grant. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean took it. Uh, I, I, touched I, touched it. Josh. I mean, Josh. <laughs> Josh. Yeah. Oh, thank you, my dear. Ellen Tchaikowski, Office of Legislative Counsel. I'm here on the language of S237, which is the language that the Commissioner and Mr. Cochran were just talking about. Um, I am the Legislative Council in charge of uh, natural resources and zoning and Act 250. Uh, this bill is being worked on currently by three or four Legislative Council attorneys, so there will be a sort of team uh, approach to this. So I have sections one through 11. 
Um, and then Becky Wasserman has some of the sections, so she will be coming at 11.15 approximately, and then uh, David Hall has the other sections of the bill. So I will take you through at least the first 26 pages. Okay, so maybe we should tell Becky that she should come at 11.30, because she's not gonna do that in five minutes, right? Right, so. So 11.30 for? Becky, okay. and maybe 11.00. Thank you. Sure. So, starting with section one, we're in 24 VSA 4382. Uh, this is chapter 117. So, in the, we're in the municipal uh, planning section of Title 24. So, we start with the section related to municipal plans. So, the first change. Uh, so we're talking about what is required in a municipal plan. So the first change, uh, I'll start reading on line 17. A, a municipal plan shall include a utility and facility plan consisting of a map and a statement of present and prospective community facilities and public utilities showing existing and proposed educational, recreational, and other public sites buildings and facilities including hospitals, libraries, power generating plants, and transmission lines, water supply lines, facilities, and service areas, sewage disposal lines, facilities, and service areas, refuse disposal, storm drainage, and other facilities and activities, and recommendations to meet future needs for community facilities and services with indications of priorities Priority of need, costs, and methods of financing. So this is adding a requirement that the municipal plan map, uh, plan map includes the water supply lines, facilities, and service areas, and sewage lines, facility, and service areas. And why? Uh, I, I believe the justification, and unless you would like to hear from uh, the, the department on this, is related to gathering more data and details um, on these water supply and sewage supply systems. Um, where they are is important to the build out, but I can't speak specifically to the, the actual. That's, that's why I want to get them back in. I got it, Mark. Um, the next change also to the plan, um, a housing element shall include a recommended program for addressing low and moderate income persons housing needs as identified by the Regional Planning Commission pursuant to subdivision 4348AA9 of this title. The program shall comply with the requirements of 4412 of this title to provide affordable housing. Uh, so that changes just slightly what's already there because uh, 4412 is going to be amended in the next section so it's just referencing the change that is about to, to be made. <coughs> so then section two, uh, we're now in the bylaws uh, subchapter of title of chapter 117. So uh, <coughs> amending 4412, notwithstanding any existing bylaw, the following land development provisions shall apply in every municipality equal tre treatment of housing and required provisions for affordable housing. <coughs> Bylaws shall designate appropriate districts and reasonable regulations for multi-unit or multi-family dwellings. No bylaw shall have the effect of excluding these multi-unit or multi-family dwellings from the municipality. Within any regulatory district that allows multi-unit residential dwellings, no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting multi-unit residential dwellings of four or fewer units as an allowed permitted use or of conditioning approval based on the character of the area. So this is, uh, if you're allowing uh, in, the, in the zoning district multi-unit um, dwellings, you must allow four units. You can prohibit more than that, but it has to be a baseline of four units allowed. Um, what 
condition and approval based upon the character of the area that if it's a permitted use, can they condition approval on the character of an area generally? I'm not sure. I'm a little bit unclear about this language. I'll need to, to work with the department a little bit more. I'm not entirely sure. I'm still new to this area. Okay. So. Um, do you want to answer or wait? Um, okay, let's try and not be quick. I mean, okay. Conditional character of the area is a vague standard. It's often used to appeal any new housing development. Um, so um, while you may allow it, you can still appeal it based on the building or the plans not being consistent with the character of the area. I'm sorry, that was a little too soft. Yeah. Uh, You're using your soft uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I did all my voice this morning. Yeah. Uh, um, so while you can permit a use um, through, you know, through other reviews, um, you can say it's not consistent with the character of the area. You can reduce the density. So the intent behind this was to say, if you're going to allow four units, allow four units and don't make this something that could be appealed and moved down to a much, much smaller project. So right now, in zoning law, there's always a, a, an overlay of a disallowance based upon if it's inconsistent with the character of the area, and we're taking that away in multifamily districts. <laughs> you can allow it. I'm not using character as an excuse for not, not doing this. Right? But what would that do to a place that, um, where, say, a, a double wide is going to go into a, a neighborhood? Um, you, you, have, you, know, you have to allow uh, housing, um, and we have a housing problem. And have the density and water and wastewater resources to support. Okay. So again, these were, um, I should say, we crafted this bill to have a conversation about mm -hmm. our, our housing shortages and what we're going to do about it. There's a whole package of ideas in here, and what was going to stick and what was not. It was to be determined that we wanted to have a conversation about yes. how do we increase density in our downtown and village centers and engage communities in the conversation to have you know, their part of the solution. Right. Um, to just say we're going to change Act 250 and change the wastewater connection and add a little bit of money, only to get you so far. You need you know, municipalities control land use. <coughs> this is attitude change. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is sort of supporting the notion that you can't hide behind and and the clear, character. You know, here in Horn, it's a little worked up over these things. <laughs> um, only some of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, they also use wastewater. And, water period as, as, as an excuse and a barrier, as we talked about you know, the difference between septic and waste and, and, and a water system and a sewer system. And many communities complain that their sewer water fees are too high, and the way to lower those fees are to so add more connections. No, they don't want to necessarily go into existing water. I don't know if you can help me. On page two, mm -hmm. um, it says, Notwithstanding any existing bylaw, the following, 16, the following provision shall apply to everything else. Oh. I just want to know if there's really any hook here to promote some of the things we're going to be doing by saying in every municipality they have to uh, have required provisions for affordable housing. So uh, that's related to when 4412 was enacted, there are already existing towns with plans and bylaws in place. And so in order to sort of recognize um, moving forward, new bylaws have to incorporate what's in the statute. So it, moving forward, uh, updated bylaws and bylaw amendments have to incorporate these. I don't know if there's necessarily a hook, but it, does, it didn't, as 4412 has evolved, it didn't undo prior existing bylaws in municipalities. So moving forward. I guess what I'm trying to find the answer to is, are there some required provisions for affordable housing 
elsewhere in the law. Seems to say a town can't uh, override provisions for affordable housing. I'm trying to figure out what those required provisions look like. I know there are laws about equal treatment on housing, but are there required provisions that apply to towns, all towns, vis-a-vis -vis affordable housing? I would like to say yes, but I, I'm trying to think of any specifically. Um, I'm not sure. I can I can get back to you. Bless you. Bless you. Okay. Can you say you can find out? Because that'd be good to know what the existing law is on required provisions for affordable housing that are applicable to all town bylaws as we move forward. That already exists. What, what is the definition of affordable housing? I don't know. Bill? <laughs> I don't know. That's probably it's pretty important, isn't it? It's pretty yeah. probably different than it is in other yeah. sections of law. But uh, okay, let's go back to page three. Yes, um, line eight. <clears throat> except, for, <coughs> except for flood hazard and fluvial erosion area bylaws adopted pursuant to section forty-four twenty-four of this title, no bylaw shall have the effect of excluding as a permitted use one accessory dwelling unit that is located within or pertinent to an owner-occupied single-family dwelling. A bylaw may require a single-family dwelling with an accessory dwelling unit to be subject to the same review, dimensional, or other controls as required for a single-family dwelling without an accessory dwelling unit. By pertinent to, does that mean physically attached? No. What um, does that mean? I do not have the definition in front of me, but a pertinent is generally um, within the immediate area. For example, an adjacent cottage, for example. I believe so, yes. Or a garage, or a, something that is immediately in close proximity, I think is what it's. I, I believe so, I'd have to check, but yeah, a pertinent to is generally not a, an attached structure. But in close proximity to. <clears throat> um, we can Google it. That's what I'm doing right now. Good there, there are a um, bunch of changes in subsection E dealing with accessory dwelling units. Yes. Could you sort of, as opposed to going through each one initially, uh, could you basically say what the law is now and what we're trying to accomplish here? Sure, so yeah, so this next section was going to amend the definition of, of accessory dwelling unit. And currently, that has to be an efficiency or a one bedroom apartment that is clearly subordinate to a single family dwelling um, that has facilities for independent living, sleeping, food preparation, sanitation, has sufficient water capacity, and isn't more than 30% the size of the family, the single family dwelling. So this uh, change is going to uh, reduce um, that definition so it takes out the clearly subordinate and the 30% um, so that it's a distinct unit, uh, not necessarily with the size restriction on it. So, what um, can, and these accessory units are permitted uses in. Um, zones, I guess, even zones where it says single family dwelling, right? So now you can take a single family dwelling and it sounds with the broadening of this definition, you basically turn your house into a duplex. What's, what's the difference between a duplex and an accessory unit in this particular case? So that's Probably fair. It is. It is removing the requirement that it be clearly subordinate. So it's it's allowing for the creation of a unit that would be either you know of equal or greater size potentially than the original unit. So if you, if you had a zone that wanted to be single family and, you, and the town didn't want duplexes put in there, now this is effectively a way around that 
ban on duplexes. Just call it an accessory dwelling. I haven't thought of it specifically that way, but potentially. Okay. There's no requirement. I remember when we first worked on this law, it was you have to, the person living in the unit had to be related or something. And I think it was only for people over 55. I guess the law has gone through. It was some for mother's law and part of the law. Yes. So that's yeah. not. No, that no. anymore. Related and older. <laughs> and the other big thing that's being removed here is setbacks, coverage, parking requirements. Uh, so, again, just kind of for advocates. I support this kind of direction, uh, but if, if you had, um, you might have certain parking requirements uh, based upon a, for a duplex, but if you set it up as an accessory apartment, you might not be able to impose different parking requirements as what might exist for a single family home. Can you, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> else. I'm just thinking that again, it's sort of the same question. You know, you don't have um, you don't have the uh, uh, the wording that's clearly subordinate to the word. So you can set up uh, a single family house to effectively become a duplex. Can you avoid the parking requirements of the duplex? by labeling it as an accessory apartment because you no longer suffer from any parking restrictions or setback restrictions coverage. Um, potentially, and I, parking, I have come to learn that there's lots of things about parking requirements that I do not know about um, that can be a complicated thing. So I don't specifically know about the difference between parking requirements for duplexes as opposed to single family, and so, Potentially, but I'm not. I'm not certain. And, and Michael, aren't and Ellen, aren't these all these opportunities subordinate to and have to uh, uh, comply by municipal law? So no, uh, I thought it did. These are the well, right. So I mean, but I thought our understanding is that part of our easing things was enabling was. They wouldn't be getting these designations if they didn't have municipal reviews and ordinances in place. No, I'm on the wrong thing here. Okay, so it, I would see municipalities having a total heart attack by you taking away parking issues here if if it isn't requiring also that anyway because uh, for example many downtowns have parking restrictions in the winter. If you do not have parking requirements on some of these things. They're, they're going to be, I can use a phrase I'd normally use, but not with so many in the audience, but people are going to be challenged by, by this in downtown. Um, Particularly when there's no place to park in the winter. If, you know. Well, so I mean, look, we're, we're embarking upon an area where I think we're going to obviously hear from the league and other municipalities. But we're embarking upon an area where, just like we did 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when we first set up these accessory partners as possible uses, where you're going to have to balance the needs of the municipality with the needs of trying to create more housing. Exactly. And, you know, it's almost sort of like an indie kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I would also add, I think that this language needs work. Mm -hmm. I think that the proposal evolved as this bill was drafted and um, potentially doesn't reflect um, all of the proposal you heard this morning. I think that it has changed, that what is here maybe doesn't necessarily reflect where the, the agency is now. And so l the language needs to be looked at to accomplish what is, what the goal is. Right. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just to be clear, the agency may have helped us 
start to write this bill, but we will be the ones writing it. <laughs> okay. Um, on to page four. Uh, nothing in subdivision A1E of this section, which is the section we just talked about with the accessory dwelling units, shall be construed to prohibit a bylaw that is less restrictive of a of a accessory dwelling unit or a bylaw that regulates short-term rental units distinctly from residential rental units. So this is saying that So uh, in in sort of reducing the requirements for an accessory dwelling unit some of the uh, language has been taken out and so now this is adding language about short-term rental units being regulated distinctly from residential r rental units and so this does relate to the sort of Airbnb concept um, in researching this I so as you are probably aware, we have a, a Dillon's rule structure, and so municipalities can only regulate in the way that the state has given them power to do. And so I am not certain currently that municipalities have the power to regulate short-term rental units. I'm not the expert on that. That is a, another attorney in our office. So there is some conflicting information, but I think potentially that this is adding an ability to regulate that we didn't already give them, so that might be something for you yeah. to think about too. That was my understanding from Tucker when I spoke with him about the short term mental language that uh, I'd asked and you know, included. So, okay. He wasn't clear either. I mean, he was pretty sure. So, if you want the municipalities to be able to regulate short-term rental units, then yes. we would want this section in here, right? If you want to give them that power, you will need to include language like this somewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. To we distinctly will. have them regulated distinct from residential properties. Oh, so yes. Right. So yes. right, exactly. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the next section uh, is related to ex uh, small lots. So the change is on the top of page five. A municipality may prohibit development of a lot not served by and able to connect to municipal <coughs> sewer and water service. If either of the following applies, the lot is less than one acre in area or the lot has a width <coughs> or depth <laughs> dimension of less than 40 feet. So uh, a muni this says a, a, a municipality may ban development on less than one acre, one eighth of an acre, if it is unable to connect to sewer and water service. And right now, the they, law is that they could ban development just based upon the size of the lot? Yes. So, and, and is there any, there's no waiver provisions in the law that are not shown here to, to for someone presently to go in and uh, develop a small lot? Um, so the, the small paragraph I, I jumped over on four states that if there is a, a lot that is created um, when the municipality changed their changes their regulation, they are sort of they are allowed to develop on a yeah they're grandfathered. So yeah. So the next uh, set of language is entitled inclusionary growth. And it is the the proposal related to requiring uh, municipalities to allow uh, small uh, uh, a greater de greater density. Uh, so this creates sort of an opt out provision that I'll get to. Um, but 
except in a municipality that has reported substantial municipal constraints in accordance with subdivision B2 of this section and notwithstanding any existing bylaw other than flood hazard and fluvial erosion area bylaws adopted pursuant to section 4424 of this title, the following land provisions shall apply to every <coughs> municipality. No bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting the creation of residential lots of at least 10,890 square feet or one quarter acre within any regulatory district allowing residential uses served by and able to connect to a water system operated by a municipality or 5,400 5, square feet or one eighth acre within any regulatory district allowing residential uses served by and able to connect to a water and sewer system operated by a municipality. So this allows for uh, smaller uh, areas as long as they're, the difference being if they can connect to the sewer system. So it's one quarter acre if you can connect to the water system, uh, one eighth acre if you can connect to water and sewer. Page six, the appropriate municipal panel or administrative officer as applicable shall condition any subdivision approval on obtaining a state wastewater permit pursuant to 10 VSA chapter 64. No bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting or requiring conditional use approval for a two unit dwelling on any lot within any regulatory district allowing residential uses served by and able to connect to a water and sewer system operated by a municipality to any greater extent than a one unit dwelling would be prohibited or restricted within any such district with no additional review, dimensional or other controls than would be required for a single family dwelling without a second unit. When a bylaw establishes a parking minimum for residential properties, each residential parking space shall be leased, that will be leased separately from residential units, shall count as two spaces for purposes of meeting the parking minimum for any proposed development located within a half mile of a transit stop. The parking space leased costs, lease costs shall be reasonably proportional to the production, operation, and maintenance cost of the space to reduce generalized subsidy of leased spaces by other residents. A municipality may condition the municipal land permit on continuation of the separate leasing of parking spaces and residential units. So what is, we go up back to the top. Sure. The subsection B. Yep. Um, this is not the law currently. You can do a subdivision right now without getting a wastewater permit. I am not sure. Okay. Um, we. Do you have the answer to that? Yeah, you can subdivide. In your in the subdivision. Subdivision just divides the lot. You still have to get a permit to actually build something. When you, oh, this is just yeah. for just subdividing, not building. Okay. Uh, and then on D, what's being what's what's happening here? In subsection D. What's in su subsection? Uh, D, 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 D. Oh, D. Parking. Yeah. Um, so this relates to when a municipality has minimum parking requirements for a residential property. If the development will be leasing the parking space as opposed to including it in the rent, it shall count as two parking spaces instead of one. Uh, and I would ask maybe that Chris explain further. <laughs> uh, it's trying to find a market-based approach to parking. A 
lot of our communities, to your point, yeah, parking is a real problem. Yeah, but there are lots of parking opportunities. There are shared parking opportunities. A lot of yes. businesses have parking needs during the day, but not at night. Can these be leased? And if you find this a, a parking place for somebody who needs one, um, can we lower our bill for all parking requirement? Can we you know, find parking in other places? Can we pull parking resources? Right. And uh, I, I get that, but there are many. You know, because we have to accommodate municipalities' requirements, particularly in the winter, where they were, where they many of them have no on-street parking. We're a rural state. We're yeah. going to have cars. People, yeah. you know, we're not all going well, to be walking and riding our bicycles, you know, yeah. tomorrow. Um, but you know, parking is a, is a barrier, and it adds yeah. cost to housing. And oftentimes, you know, an example is you know we build a senior housing complex where there's not a lot of need for parking, but the building says you need 78 spaces that go unused. And if those are built, could we use them? Yes. You know, it could to be provide yes. you know, um, parking opportunities for places where there's just no room. So how but do we get more out of what Developers need to partner with parking opportunities yeah. and or. And this is working other jurisdiction. Um, I get. It. <laughs> so what happens? I mean, one would read so like you can lease. You have a home and you have. Uh, Driveway space. You can lease that driveway space to somebody else, mm -hmm. and it counts as. So, if, if the owner leases the space or allows the tenant to lease the space, that counts. We're, look, we're just looking for like, you know, it's hard to regulate parking in a way that's flexible. But if I'm a builder of an EDU and I need to find a parking space. Maybe I can go talk to the neighbor. Mm -hmm. So that can come. Right, creating creative opportunities to find parking and not yeah. build more when it's not needed. Right. Is the intent of the section whether you know there are other ideas out there? Um, you know, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the state program directors for municipal and water sewer funding, and the Vermont Community Development Board, the Vermont Housing De Downtown Development Board, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, the and the Natural Resources Board, as well as any person requesting notice. Any person may provide comment on the municipality's report to the Commissioner of Housing and Development, Housing and Development within 60 days of the filing. The department shall post all comments with the report on the department's website. A municipality that has filed a substantial municipal constraint report shall update the report each time it updates its municipal plan or bylaws. Failure to update the report shall disqualify the municipality from the incentives identified in subdivision three of this subsection B and may subject the, muni the municipality to review by the commissioner of housing and community development pursuant to section 4351 of this title. Incentives and funding. On or before July 1, 2021, any municipality that requests technical assistance from a regional planning commission to update local bylaws to address inclusionary growth as described in subdivision one of this subsection B shall receive priority technical assistance through additional funding made available to the applicable regional planning commission by section 4306 of this title or municipal funding made available through the municipal planning grant program established in 4306 of this title and may use resources developed by the Department of Housing and Community Development to assist with the updates. The following state funding programs shall prioritize funding in municipalities that have updated their bylaws to comply with this subsection or are actively pursuing actions that will bring their bylaws into compliance with this section. State funding for municipal water and sewer systems, municipal planning grants under section 4306 of this title, Vermont Community Development Program under 10 VSA chapter 29 subchapter one, and neighborhood development area historic tax credits under 32 VSA 5930 CC. A municipality that has adopted bylaws that comply with subdivision one of this subsection B may adopt bylaws that allow land development that has been restricted by covenants conditions or restrictions in conflict with the goals of this chapter and duly adopted municipal policies. This subsection shall not affect the enforceability of any existing deed restrictions. So this is all new development? So, yes, so that section I just read, subsection four, is, a, is, about to, is referring to the section I'm about to talk about in section three. So, <laughs> it, it's related to um, restrictive covenants on the land can't um, be effective. So, so what you just read this seems to say that the state shall prioritize funding in each of these areas for for communities that are. Um, trying to update their bylaws to conform with this. Yes. Um, is there any guardrails or uh, definitions or are you thinking rulemaking? How are you going to define the word priority? I mean, does that mean that they could potentially get all the funding if they need it? Uh, just these communities are going to get all the funding, and the other programs might, or are they get a, a point system, or they get 10% priority. I mean, is that something that you've thought through? Um, yeah, we, it's a currently existing. Like right now, all of our designated centers get a priority consideration from our grants and programs, as well as other sister agencies. So we don't necessarily dictate the degree of priority or how they prioritize. So our programs, if you have a designation, you're almost assured funding. Um, but sometimes funding is competitive and it requires considered, but there's also other factors. So there's not a strict definition of how the priority will be placed. Uh, but it's just give these, um, after grant requests, um, additional consideration in these communities because they're trying to meet these requirements and trying to find 
more affordable housing solutions and we should reward them. Is there a time, um, any kind of time limit on these applications and stuff? How much time is this going to add to the development of a of a unit or several units? Add or save? Let um, me understand the question. Well, I'm just wondering what it's going to do to someone who wants to put a unit in. Um, you know, how much? Time is going to. How much is this going to delay the development of units? Um, As communities if, adopt this process. Well, if this process is adopted, will it affect the timing of? It should speed. Should speed it, should should speed speed it up. Yes. Okay. We're asking communities to say, where do you want your housing? And it's going to be easier to develop housing in areas where you've been identified. Let's try to limit appeals. Let's try to remove some so of the barriers. That complicate and delay projects. Um, let's you know, solve the parking problems. Again, land's the biggest cost in usually building something new. So if we can create more housing opportunities in large lots than sewer sewer areas, uh, that's what we should do. Um, but they're, you know, they're hard conversations. You know? But it is the most cost effective place to develop yeah. because all the infrastructure is there to serve. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Section 3 adds new language to uh, Title 27 covenants, conditions, and restrictions of substantial public interest. Deed restrictions, covenants, or similar binding agreements running with the land added after July 1, 2020, that prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting <coughs> land development allowed under the municipal bylaws in a municipality that has adopted a bylaw in accordance with 24 VSA 4412B4, which is the inclusionary growth provisions we just talked about, shall not be valid. So this is a provision that overrides restrictive covenants that may be in deeds or contracts. Um, it That's may, the, this is how can it even happen? <clears throat> I think this is a little challenging for downtowns that also need green space. So to go to your better places aspect, some of those covenants may actually be helping communities be better places those green spaces that may be by covenant uh, undeveloped may actually be enhancing the downtown. So uh, a little sure. bit of a worry about that. Yeah, well, the, the intent is not to um, um, get rid of any conservation reasons, historic preservation, Smith's Islands, and properties. The intent is uh, um, many neighborhoods have associations and only single family can have them. Right, okay. And, I, that's mm -hmm. and those are the covenants we want to get rid of. But, <clears throat> but we haven't articulated that conservation easements are not included yeah, in that. And this was brought up by our stakeholders. So, so this was earlier drafts. So, so to me, it would be very important to make sure that we don't include conservation easements. Um, I think that language potentially would have some other, um, there's some other concerns potentially, so that if you're interested in that provision, we'll need some yes, further. Yes, needs a, little, a, a lot of additional work. But I, I get the, 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 the point of that for those particular for those companies. And this, this just enables the municipality to do it as a requirement. If it's a barrier to. Anything. All right, section four, uh, session law provision on report on substantial municipal constraints. On or before January 15th, 2023, the Department of Housing and Community Development shall report to the General Assembly on any substantial municipal constraint reports received. The report shall address the number of municipalities that have reported substantial community restraints, the nature of the restraints, the impact of the development of housing in those municipalities, and any steps the department recommends towards reducing or eliminating constraints. All right, so that ends the municipal zoning part of this bill. Next, 
will be the Acts 250 sections. I think that might be a good place to stop. Okay. Uh, several of us have lunchtime meetings. Uh, we're five minutes <coughs> away. We've got a lot, covered a lot today. So, so we'll have you back next week. We can continue to go forward on this bill. And uh, thank everybody. And for the birthday, good start. For the birthday yeah. present.